Welcome everyone to the LCRR Tribal Roundtable today. Uh, we're glad you're here with us. Um, my name is Dr. Iris Prettypaint, and I'm going to serve as your facilitator today and to help move us, um, next slide please, help to move us through our agenda today. I'm a member of the Blackfeet Nation in Montana, and uh, today I'll serve as uh, your timekeeper. And like many meetings that you join in Indian country, we always like to open in a good way. And so today we've invited um, Jean Sorrell from the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes to help open us up today. Jean, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Iris. And uh, Lam Lam's for allowing me this opportunity to pray and to start the meeting in a good way. This quick school zootin, Messia. Thank you all for inviting me here. And as my sister from the coast would say, I start you off with a water blessing and ask that the Creator sprinkles water all over you and keeps you safe and healthy. And uh, we pray that we have a good meeting and pray that we have good works because water is the lifeblood of our people. It takes and serves as a place to travel, to nourishment and to keep our bodies fresh and clean. Grandfather Creator, we just ask that you bless Mother Earth as she takes care of our water and to take and for us to take and find ways to improve how we take, how we move through our lives and they can continue to protect our water. The sovereignty of the Indian people, Grandfather Creator, it depends on the water and to help everybody to take and just do their parts in a good way. I open this meeting. Lam Lam Tupia, bless each and every one of your hearts. Bless the hearts of your family members and bless them. And thank you for allowing our people here to take and participate in this great endeavor of our lives, Grandfather. Lam Lam Tupia, Pesia, Shehoi. Thank you, Jean. Appreciate that very much. Um, so, moving through uh, today, I'd like to welcome. Our first, um, our first uh, speaker, and we'd like to invite Yu Ting Galarian. Yu Ting. Thank you, Iris. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yu Ting Galarian. I am the deputy director of the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water in the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Um, thank you for participating in today's Lead and Copper Rule Revision Tribal Roundtable. Um, I also want to thank uh, Jean Sorrell for attending and leading the prayer for us today. In my role at the EPA, I direct the programs responsible for developing and implementing the national primary drinking water regulations, including the Lead and Copper Rule. I'm also the co-chair of the Federal Tribal Infrastructure Task Force. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. I'd also also like to invite, um, we have a lot of people in listening mode today. Anita, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, okay. Iris. Thank you, Iris. Uh, good afternoon and good morning. My name, I'm Anita Tompkins. I'm the director of the Drinking Water Protection Division in the United States Environmental Protection Agency. In my role, as well as in new things, I direct the programs responsible for implementing the national primary drinking water regulations, including the lead and copper rule. Additionally, I direct the program responsible for the direct implementation of the drinking water regulations in Indian country. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Um, and I'd also like to welcome Anne-Marie to Chile. Anne-Marie. Good morning, everyone. I'm Anne Marie Chischilly, and I'm the executive director for the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals out of Flagstaff, Arizona. Good morning. Thank you, Anne Marie. Uh, next slide. So, I'm going to serve today to walk us through this agenda today. And as you notice, we're going to move at a pretty fast clip here. 
but we're going to uh, go over an overview. Uh, EPA is going to provide an overview of the lead and copper rule revisions. We're also going to host three roundtables today. Each one of them, ha they'll have a theme, and this will be the opportunity for our tribal representatives today to provide comments. And uh, those roundtables, the first two will be for 30 minutes. And the third one will be for 25 minutes. And I just want to remind you, um, I always manage over talkers and under talkers. I just want to welcome you to be mindful so that we can hear lots of voices today. And then we'll do our closing and wrap up. And so with that, I'd like to provide a few ground rules for us. Um, just be careful, be mindful of the time that we have today. We have two hours. And um, if, you're, uh, if you're on camera and speaking, just remember to unmute your line when you're going to um, share your thoughts. Also, um, raise your hand. Uh, and we have so, a team of us on the back side that'll monitor your virtual hand. Um, and we'll make sure that we can call on people in order. And then just be mindful of the background noise when you do open up your, uh, your video sound. Um, you know, if there's a lot of sound, uh, you can just let us know, but we are recording the session. We wanna make sure that we, we get a clear sound here. And then last but not least, over here in the chat box, those of you that have prepared written comments, please feel free to add those into the chat box or follow the link and, and that'll take you and give you that opportunity today to um, add those comments. Next slide. And so our invited guests today, the majority of them are here uh, with us and we have the Blackfeet Nation and their representatives. We have the Kusa Nation and their representatives online with us. We have the Navajo Nation, uh, the Porch Band of Creek Indians are with us today. Um, these are, we're honored to have all of you join us. Next slide. We have the Seminole Tribe of Florida with us, the Intertribal Council of Arizona. We also have the United South and Eastern Tribes, and we have the University of Arizona. And so again, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to listening to your comments. Next slide. And so with that, I'd like to invite Zainab, if you could uh, join us on video. And so those of you that are, um, that are on video, if you need to take yourself down, that would be fine. Zainab? Hi, yes. Hi. Um, so before Zen of Star, I just wanted to um, kind of set the, sort of the stage for today's discussion, if I may. Okay. So um, as Iris and um, Anita and myself have already spoke about, uh, EPA is conducting this roundtable today to hear directly from you about the lead and copper rule related issues. They're most important to you and uh, how lead has impacted the tribal communities that you represent and serve. So really welcome to all the participants here today, including representatives from tribal nations, tribal water utilities, consortia, um, academia, and all the members of the public viewing via live stream. Um, Iris, that, that was a very impressive set of uh, participants uh, that you have just introduced. I also wanna thank Anne-Marie uh, Ciscelli, Director of the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals and Interim Vice President of the Office of Native American Initiative for being here today. Um, EPA recognizes that the range of experiences regarding lead and drinking water in Indian country, and we look forward to hearing your perspectives on this critical issue. Your input will help us as we review the lead and copper rule revision and work to ensure that we are doing our best to protect public health, especially for those that are most at risk and impacted by lead and drinking water. So again, thank you for taking the time today to be here. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Um, Anita and I both look forward to hearing your thoughts and others from EPA and your perspective about how EPA can assure the lead and copper rule revision protect tribal communities. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn over to Zenith. 
Thank you, Yu Ting. Hi, everyone. It's good to be here with you today. My name is Zainab Alatar, and I'm a scientist in EPA's Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water Standards and Risk Management Division. Before we dive into today's discussion, I'll be providing an overview of the lead and copper rule revisions, also known as the LCRR. Next slide, please. The lead and copper rule, or LCR, is a regulation to control the levels of lead and copper in public drinking water systems. EPA revised the rule in January 2021. The revised rule, also known as the lead and copper rule revisions, or LCRR, are now being reviewed by EPA in accordance with President Biden's Executive Order 13990. EPA has been conducting virtual engagements to inform the agency's review of the LCRR. During today's roundtable, EPA wants to hear from tribes and tribal communities about your thoughts on the LCRR and your experiences with lead and drinking water. As Yu Ting just noted, your input will help inform the agency as it reviews and makes decisions regarding the LCRR. Next slide, please. Right, first, let's go over some background information about lead and drinking water. Lead in pipes, solar faucets can dissolve in water or break off as particles and enter drinking water. Lead service lines, which are the pipes that connect homes to water mains, are the most significant sources of lead in drinking water, particularly in older homes. In children, exposure to lead can cause serious health effects like lower IQ and learning and behavioral problems. In adults, health effects can include higher risk of heart disease, high blood pressure, and kidney and nervous system problems. Next slide, please. Under the Safe Drinking Water Act, or SIDWA, EPA has the authority to regulate public water systems to address contaminants that may have adverse effects on human health. SIDWA specifies that these regulations apply to any collection, treatment, storage, and distribution facilities under the control of the public water system. As I noted earlier, the lead and copper rule, or LCR, was first established in 1991 to reduce exposure to lead and copper in drinking water and protects public health. Because many of the sources of lead and copper are in buildings plumbing systems, the LCR establishes treatment requirements for some water systems to treat drinking water to keep lead in place and prevent it from entering drinking water. This is called corrosion control. When corrosion control is not enough to reduce lead levels, the LCR requires water systems to take additional actions, including replacing lead service lines and educating the public about the risks of lead in drinking water and the steps they can take to reduce their exposure. Next slide, please. The Safe Drinking Water Act requires that EPA establish a health-based maximum contaminant level goal, or MCLG. The MCLG is not an enforceable level. The MCLG for lead is zero because there is no level of exposure to lead that is without risk. The action level for lead is 15 micrograms per liter. The action level is set at a level based on feasibility. It is based on how effective corrosion control treatment can be and is not a health-based value. The LCR requires water systems to test water in homes with lead service lines or other plumbing that contains lead. Water systems must compare the lead sample results to the action level to determine if they need to take actions to reduce lead exposure, such as installing corrosion control treatment and replacing lead service lines. Next slide, please. So we apologize, Zaneb, um, but uh, Anne-Marie, um, is here to give uh, some opening remarks and she has to actually disconnect. Okay, please go ahead. Sorry, Sorry about that, Zineb. No Anne problem. Marie? Unfortunately, she just signed off, so go ahead. We apologize for interrupting, Zineb. Okay, no problem. 
Right. So as I mentioned earlier, the LCR was most recently revised in January 2021 to increase public health protection from lead in drinking water. The revised rule, or LCRR, has several new requirements and is currently under review. Now I'm going to go over some highlights of the LCRR as published this past January. Next slide, please. The revised lead and copper rule, or LCRR, requires water systems to develop a lead service line inventory. The inventory must identify known lead service lines, also known as LSLs, and service lines for which the lead status is unknown. The LSL inventories must be publicly available. And for systems serving over 50,000 people, they must be available online. Water systems must also notify customers annually if they have a lead service line or if their service line material is unknown so they can take steps to reduce their lead risk. Next slide, please. The LCRR requires new science-based sampling techniques to better identify lead at the highest risk homes, including sampling at homes with lead service lines. At lead service line sites, water systems must collect a fifth liter sample, which captures the water that is in contact with the lead service line. The revised rule prohibits water systems from including instructions to remove or clean aerators or to conduct pre-stagnation flushing prior to sampling, which may temporarily reduce lead levels before sampling. The LCRR also requires the use of wide mouth sampling bottles, which allows for flow rates more similar to typical use. Next slide, please. Another new feature of the revised rule is the addition of the trigger level of 10 micrograms per liter. This is in addition to the action level and is not a replacement. The addition of the lead trigger level means that water systems must take action sooner than in the previous rule. If a system exceeds the trigger level and the system does not have corrosion control treatment or CCT, they must conduct a study which prepares the system to install CCT if they later exceed the action level. If the system does have CCT, they must make adjustments so it's more effective at reducing lead levels. If the system has lead service lines, they must also start a goal-based lead service line replacement program and inform the public of opportunities to have their lead service lines replaced. Next slide, please. The revised rule also requires water systems to monitor more frequently and for longer. Systems above the trigger level must monitor for lead at least annually. They must continue annual monitoring for at least two years after the last monitoring period above the trigger level. Systems above the action level must monitor every six months. They must continue six month monitoring for at least two years after the last monitoring period above the action level. Systems with a source water or long-term treatment change must monitor every six months. Next slide, please. The LCRR also improves corrosion control treatment, or CCT, requirements, including requiring water systems to be prepared to install CCT if they exceed the action level. The revised rule also removes provisions that allow water systems to stop the CCT installation process if their lead levels decreased below the action level. In the revised rule, a system must complete CCT installation if they exceed the action level. The LCRR also includes a new find and fix provision which requires water systems to evaluate individual sites with lead tap sample results greater than 15 micrograms per liter. The water system must determine if a fix is needed, including localized adjustment to CCT, flushing, or other measures. The fix may be outside of the system's control, such as premise plumbing, but they must provide documentation to the primacy agency. Next slide, please. The LCRR requires more systems to replace lead service lines, also known as LSLs. The revised rule requires that a water system replace the entire lead service line in order to meet replacement requirements if they exceed the lead action level. The LCRR eliminates loopholes that allowed LSLs to remain in place, such as test out provisions, which counted an LSL as replaced if a water system, if a water sample taken from the LSL is less than 15 micrograms per liter. Water systems serving over 10,000 people that exceed the trigger level must implement a goal-based lead service line replacement program. Additionally, a water system 
Water systems serving over 10,000 people must conduct lead service line replacement if they exceed the action level, regardless of their CCP status. This is a change from the previous rule, where lead service line replacement could have been delayed up to 48 months while CCT was installed. Water systems must also conduct lead service line replacement until the system is at or below the action level for two years. This is one year longer than in the previous rule. Next slide, please. The revised rule includes new compliance flexibilities for small water systems serving fewer than 10,000 people and for non-transient, non-community water systems. If a water system exceeds the trigger level, they must choose one of four compliance options and obtain approval from the primacy agency. The water system must implement the approved option if they later exceed the action level. The four options are to install and maintain optimized CCT, replace all flood service lines within 15 years, and the system cannot stop once they start, install and maintain point of use devices on outlets used for drinking or replace all lead bearing plumbing. Next slide, please. The LCRR expands public education and notification requirements. This includes notification within 24 hours to all persons served by the water system if the system exceeds the lead action level. It also includes notifying a person within three days if their individual sample result is greater than 15. The revised rule requires water systems to deliver public education materials to impacted consumers during water-related work that may disturb lead service lines, so they can take steps to reduce their risk. The LCRR also revises the consumer confidence report requirements to include clear health effects language, a statement on the availability of the lead service line inventory, the range of lead tap sample, tap sample levels, and information on how to access the full results. Next slide, please. Finally, for the first time, the rule requires community water systems to test for lead in schools and childcare facilities. Water systems must sample elementary schools and childcare facilities once over a five-year period. Water systems must sample secondary schools if they request it. After one five-year round, the water system must sample for lead in any school or childcare facility that requests sampling. Water systems must also provide a copy of EPA's three T's for reducing lead in drinking water in schools and childcare facilities so that facilities can take actions to reduce lead levels. Water systems must annually certify to the primacy agency that they have completed the requirements. Water systems are not responsible for schools or childcare facilities that decline sampling or do not respond to attempts to schedule sampling, but this information is reported to the primacy agency. EPA does not have the statutory authority to require schools or childcare facilities to take remediation actions or conduct additional sampling. Next slide, please. EPA is in the process of engaging with the public and stakeholders, particularly communities that are, that are most at risk of exposure to lead and drinking water. EPA has extended the LCRR effective date to provide time to obtain their feedback and inform review of the LCRR. EPA held public listening sessions on April 28th and May 5th and a series of community roundtables in June and July. Today's roundtable is specifically for tribes and tribal communities to hear your input and your perspectives. Later this week, EPA will be holding a national stakeholder roundtable and next week, EPA will host a national co-regulator meeting to review input provided in these virtual public engagements. EPA is also considering written comments on the LCRR submitted to www.regulations.gov, DACA ID number EPA HQ OW 2021-0255 until July 30th, 2021. Next slide, please. For more information on lead in drinking water, the lead and copper rule revisions, and on what you can do to reduce your lead risk, please visit www.epa.gov slash safe water. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're gonna move over to our first round table and I'd just like for you to um, pay attention to the theme that's written at the top, identifying lead in drinking water. And these are potential uh, topics for discussion today. Uh, I want, I'll just 
remind you that this is an opportunity for your tribal perspective to come forward and to um, you know, discuss any of the topics that you see here on the screen. Uh, the lead service line inventory, tearing and sample site selection, new sampling methods, and tap sampling frequency. So at this time, I'd like to open it up to the tribal representatives and you can come on camera and just remember to unmute your line or you can use the chat box with a virtual hand to raise your hand and we'll take that in order. So I'd like to welcome uh, anyone that would like to give comments here. This is Gerald Wagner uh, with, okay. the Black Feet, with the Blackfeet Nation and also the chair of the National Tribal Environmental Caucus. I had a question on, I know we're recording this, but um, was or are the presentation, PowerPoint presentations going to be available to us? It's one question. And of the um, presentations that we'll be listening to uh, today, um, is there a way to, to uh, show what has changed in the um, the lead and copper rule, or is this all a new rewrite? Is my question. Uh, Kayana, are you there? Can you provide any um, input on those two questions for the PowerPoint and the recording? Sure. Hello, Iris. Um, yes, um, the, power, the PowerPoints will not be available, but the presentations themselves, um, these roundtables will be available for um, view after the roundtable itself. So you can go to the same YouTube link and see the presentation. Okay, thanks, Gerald. Anything else? I have a question that's concerning Flint. Uh, this is a new, very glad to see everybody here. Very glad to be a part of the round table. Um, when I visit Flint, it, it it appears that there's not really much, it, doesn't, it didn't appear that there was much oversight. Uh, the, a lot of the rules that have, have been portrayed here today um, seem to be very exciting. Um, but in the past, it looks like there was like very little oversight in terms of how they were taking care of their lead problem, which they never really took care of. And <clears throat> when you talk about um, identifying lead in the system, where they get their water from, uh, the lake, the stream, the river that they get their water from, uh, there is a bridge that's over it that's crumbling and falling apart. And it actually has lead dripping into the water that's going into one of the spouts that's feeding the water system. Um, I've seen that myself. Uh, the other question is, is that um, are there any rules on the type of piping that needs to be used? Um, the type of, are they, are they using inserts? Are the inserts going to be prefabricated? Um, is there a certain quality that's going to have to be met? Um, is there a certain uh, threshold for the piping itself uh, is one of the questions that I would like to start with. And I just want to remind the tribal representatives that today uh, I want to encourage you to share your feedback on the themes and uh, you can ask your questions, but the way we're set up today is we have people listening to your feedback. Thank you, Anu. Okay, you're welcome. Dr. Tate, do you have a comment? Not yet. Okay, Not yet. Sean? Hi, one of the themes in looking at this uh, lead and copper revisions has been <clears throat> that it's focused more on, you know, the causes versus the symptoms and stuff. So the lead uh, line inventories and things like that are, are more at getting at the root cause that's affecting these communities. Um, the, there's not an adequate, you know, inventory of lead lines across Indian country. And there's some apprehension among some tribal 
utilities to actually know what's there because they're not they're not sure if the resources will be there to address it once it's identified and then they'll be held to a replacement schedule and stuff like that under this new rule so that's one of those things of connecting resources to the uh, lead service line inventories and things of that nature especially now that it looks like it's going to be including uh, cast iron pipes and stuff like that um, is probably one of the biggest hurdles to make sure that we're getting an accurate picture of what we have in Indian country. So I just wanted to bring that up because as part of uh, a lot of people's fears is that they'll find out they have this certain amount of lead service lines in their system and not have the resources to actually uh, perform the, the replacements that will be required, you know, at, at staged percentages and things of that nature. So I just wanted to bring that up as a concern. Thank you, Sean. Um, Paloma? Um, thank you for having me here today as well. That was a really interesting presentation and updates that I think we should help with public health. But I was kind of quick there at the very end about the testing in schools and what will happen if lead is identified and if that could be clarified, how that would coordinate with the health authorities and for the families of those kids exposed to lead, um, what kind of outreaches would be required or kind of going on what the first speaker said, what will be the follow-up and follow through. And that seems like it would be extremely complicated in some of these tribal nations where there might be multiple jurisdictions and states and sovereignty involved. Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to come on camera? Michael, I see your, oh, your camera's not on, but you're up on screen. Do you have any comments? Ray, are you there? Yes, I, I can speak. Okay, what I wanted to do, I, I, I believe you all know very much as um, has been known at the EPA, the head of the EPA was here in the city of Flint. Uh, you know what's going on with the Flint water crisis, uh, with the, uh, the settlement and everything. Um, my chief uh, had to uh, do a proclamation to the city of Flint and to the state of Michigan that uh, what's going on here in the city of Flint is a crime against humanity. Um, the problem is that the, the lead has got to the point for the past seven years, it hasn't been fixed yet, seven years. So um, I had to go about, and the people here with me had to go about to find, to find our own water source. So we found it. It's a clean water source for us. It allow, it's, The water is clear. It's a, it's a bottomless aquifer. The water is clear as Fiji water. But the city of Flint is polluting that water and trying to gentrify us from the area. The reason that I have requested and asked that to, to, be, to come before you as my tribal community and nation is to get your help in stopping this from poisoning this last water source that we have here in the city of Flint. Um, I know I don't have much time to talk about it or make my presentation or whatever or something like that. So I guess it's just basically being getting back in contact with you. I would love for you to hear from my chief. Also, you heard from my ambassador, I knew. But like I said, uh, I also put in there a um, the last report from the entry and we have we have went to the United Nations. We're, we're getting to the point where it's like we got to go to the international courts. We got to try. We, we're, 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 I'm screaming for help because all, all we got is gatekeepers before us. What, what the head of the EPA met was gatekeepers, the mayor and everything. We, the children are killing each other here. The lead has affected our children so bad. It's like a bad movie, like a, like a horror show. Just yesterday, 16 year old, a 19 year old, a 19 year old girl with all the things in the world that have in her life, driving down the street in the Juneteenth parade, shot a police officer at a Juneteenth parade. This has never happened. The things is where we're, the children are killing each other. I mean, I'm just going to get to that point. I, I put it in there. And like I said, I can't take much of your time to express everything that's going on. But I'm here declaring there's an emergency going on here in the city of Flint. And the gatekeepers are keeping you, uh, they're downtown. I said, I said, the sheriff's office. I got video of everything. They make documentaries and movies about this. They're down there dancing, doing a hustle with the governor, the, the attorney general. 
But right downtown on, on, in the north side, five people got killed. They're, they're, they're murdering us, just genocide and gentrification. And on one side and, and the other side of town is whatever. I, I'm just letting you know that I've, I've taken the steps to June Drip, OAS, entry. I, I just put that in there and, and we're getting no help. And I'm just, I'm just, we're, 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 we're this is the last resort that I, I, I've, I've come to, to to speak my behalf because I've given this, this, this is grassroots <laughs> people that I'm working with. And I'll be quiet from here because I know I don't have much time, but I'm just letting you know, I got all the pr evidence, proof, and whatever you need. I got it. It's here. Well, I, that's why I, I just, God got something to do with this to give us the opportunity to speak and let you know that we're dying here. We're dying here. They, they're, 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 I, 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 will, I will silence myself from here. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate that. Uh, David? Uh, thanks, Iris. Uh, the, um, I kind of want to extend uh, Paloma's concern a little bit. Uh, we have master meters that we have uh, tied uh, BIA schools to our water systems, and they may have lead problems in those older compounds. Most of our water systems uh, were put in by the IHS under public law 86121. And that started in the 60s and it ramped up through the 70s and uh, probably uh, accelerated even more through the 80s and through today even. Uh, money is uh, pouring in, water, water lines are being built. And so I don't expect that we're going to find a lot of lead service lines. And uh, the, the question I have is, how is a service line defined? If it's defined up to and including the meter, that's one issue that uh, is far easier for us to deal with than if it were to continue down service from the meter and included the plumbing. Most of the plumbing in the homes that we serve is copper. Uh, in early 2000s, uh, IHS started putting in plastic. So that's not a, a real concern, but the plastic or the uh, copper service lines and the lead solder in those service lines, you know, if they were put in in the early 70s or whatnot would be a concern and trying to find those locations would be difficult for us. It would require us to reprioritize some of the uh, the tasks that our staff are currently working on. So uh, that's one of the one of the problems that we would be facing at here uh, on Navajo. Thank you, David. Uh, I'd like to call on Lionel. Are you there? Hi. Uh, yes, I'm. I'm here. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, go back to what uh, I believe it was Sean. Uh, uh, mentioned earlier that it is more of a resource issue, uh, along with a lot of uh, what uh, with uh, the fellow from who just spoke uh, was uh, indicating too is that a lot of these systems were built by BIA IHS in the past, and um, that a lot of the times that we don't have good as built for these systems. So uh, just to get the resources out there to find these lines and whatnot, and, and to indicate what kind of lines we have, that's that's always been an issue. Uh, many of these lines we just run into when we hit them when we're doing repairs out there. So, and then you find out what you have. Um, so, I think it's just one of those things. It is a re big resource issue that um, it seems like a lot of times that these rules come out and it becomes an unfunded mandate where these tribes are going to have to keep looking for resource resources and looking for grants and whatnot or other supplemental help to um, to even get into or caught up with these uh, regulations. And it's one of those things that always. Uh, puts us kind of like uh, at the back burner or some of these legislation and stuff like that, especially if you have uh, rules that we cannot uh, utilize uh, federal funds against federal funds sometimes to make these matching requirements on some of these grants. So uh, I think there's something in legislation wise that we need to work on on that where we can match federal funds with the federal funds for uh, some of the in-kind uh, services to provide for um, some of that uh, information because I know a lot of times we get a lot of these projects where so are you looking at like corrosion, uh, corrosion control technologies, you can get the best built plants and all the treatment, but we don't have uh, money for operation and the maintenance. And that's the, the, the issue that we have that 
we build these nice plants and everything. They run for a year or two, but then after that, then the operation and maintenance goes down because we have no funding to keep them running. So I think those are big issues that are out there that we keep pushing these things to try to get our tribes into compliance, but then at the end of the day, there's no funding to keep them going. And then we were in compliance for a couple, maybe a couple of years, and then we fall by the wayside again and started to have to play catch up again. So I think those are some of the issues that we really have to delve more into when we're talking with uh, legislators or whoever writes these policies that uh, there has to be something on the back end that helps us uh, support in uh, these uh, facilities in the long run. All right, thank you. Thank you, Lionel. We'll go to Jerry and then I'll come to Dr. Tate. Jerry? Uh, thank you. Thank you. I just want to offer a, a couple comments. One is that, uh, that most of the lead and copper rule is focused in on facilities and service lines. And I would like to just shift this for a moment. And we're very concerned about, about public health. Um, I, I, I want to talk about uh, uh, the humans and um, and, and not the facilities and service lines as a, as a source or a proxy for the, the public health concerns. I want to talk about, about um, the baseline or pre-industrial data for tribal nations uh, about blood le levels that are pre-industrial. Um, and we're aware from some of the data that the baseline is um, uh, is 625 times lower than the 10 micrograms per deciliter threshold at which CDC has said it's a level of concern prior to 2012. So we know that uh, lead exposure is really an industrial um, uh, result, and there's a disproportionate impact on our populations. We know that in the USET region, 11 of our 33 member tribal nations have tested children between the ages of zero and 16 for blood lead levels. And all but one of those that were tested when there was participation rates greater than 40% of children, at least 5% had children that had measurable blood lead levels. So we're, we're very concerned about the, the data sensitivity, uh, about reporting numbers, and that's why I'm giving those to you in the aggregate. Uh, we are following the, the uh, concerns and the protocols of our member tribal nations not to release individual tribal uh, data about blood lead levels. We report it in the aggregate. So there are data sensitivity issues. Um, um, and then we point you finally uh, just uh, of where the CDC uh, reference value is. And so there are a number of points that we have about, about where that reference level is at 97.5 percentile of the blood level distribution among children one to five years old. Uh, we think that there are uh, disproportionate impacts to uh, children in our tribal communities. And, and we know that um, there's the pre-industrial baselines we have, and we're having the, the test uh, results now. And of course, a zero is where we ought to be headed. Um, and so where that, where that reference value is set is a great concern to us. I'll stop there. I know I share some of the concerns about, not only about getting the data and uh, addressing the, the concerns about reducing lead, but how are we going to do that? Moving beyond the rule itself, the implementation of the steps to, to um, address facilities and reduce lead in our populations. Thank, Thank you. you, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Tate? Um, <clears throat> greetings. Um, um, thank you for um, um, giving me the opportunity to speak. And I just wanted to uh, speak up um, and just give my brother two white arrows over there a big hug because I know that took a lot of passion. He works really hard in the area um, as an indigenous advocate. And we have been working with our brother 
there to in efforts to re-engage this issue when we're dealing with any type of water crisis wherever our feet touches the soil under the American Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous people. And one of the things that um, I've been hearing from different speakers is the issue of resource equality. So what my question would be, or comment to the agency is how can you assist all Indigenous people wherever our feet touches the soil um, to have access to resource equality wherever we are? Um, some of us live on reservations and many of the people that we serve are just, you know, are intermingled in communities um, throughout the United States. Uh, we have a water crisis issue going on in Memphis as well. And we've identified, uh, we provide safe passage and right of return for our Aboriginal American Indians. And um, we do free services for human rights services for any people. Um, because one of the things I hope that we can walk away from this discussion is that, you know, indigenous people take a more leadership role in helping to give the agency guidance in how we even approach water from a fundamental um, standpoint as it being a living organism, you know, in our, on our planet. So I will speak a little bit later when it comes to public outreach and education, and as I am an educator as well, and we have our own school and we're getting ready to launch our indigenous um, um, clinic as well for our people as like what the last brother just said about the human issue of this. So one of the things I'm hoping that we can walk away from the EPA today is that we will um, somehow be able to come together and provide collective rights for indigenous people throughout um, the United States and how we all can tap into resource equality so that no nation of people are having to be concerned about, you know, following rules, but we're not having access to the proper materials and equipment and operations um, funding or and women manpower to make it happen and to improve the conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tate. Um, any other comments from the tribal representatives? Thank you so much for your uh, feedback, uh, your thoughts on that on this first theme. And I'd like to um, ask our listeners here, uh, Yu Ting and Anita, uh, any reflections on what you heard from our first theme today? Thank you, Iris, and thank you uh, to all who have already provided um, feedback to the agency. Um, I definitely heard a lot of the kind of um, alignment in your comments in regards to resource. And thank you, Dr. Tay, to talk about resource equity and equality issue. Um, that is definitely something that um, our administration, our administrator is very focused on is equity and environmental justice, as well as the resource um, that we need to have to provide um, to address the water. Uh, quality concerns. Um, really also appreciate a lot of folks, um, Paloma, really appreciate your bringing up um, kind of this implementation and the connection, the so what after the testing is done at schools, how to coordinate with health authorities. And, um, and also, um, I think David, uh, who spoke about the clear definition of the less service line, um, where does it end? Kind of the, the question to have more clarity around that. Um, so really also wanna appreciate a lot of the um, remarks uh, related to the human rights and also Dave, uh, Jerry, your remark about um, the baseline uh, blood lead level. That's ultimately uh, what we're here to do is to provide public health protection and uh, not to lose sight of that. Anita, anything that you would like to add? Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Yi Ting. And once again, thank you everyone for your input and, and, and your feedback on that. Um, and I would say another thing that we also heard was oversight. I think that was one of the broader things is like when they, when they have implementation, how are we going to ensure oversight that um, so that they so that we can still be concerned about this public health issue. And then also hearing when Paloma and Jerry were bringing up uh, about schools, but then um, also understanding the BIA connection with the schools and how, the, how do we work with that because there's multiple jurisdictions um, when it comes to that. So just getting a little bit more granularity 
on that. But thank you so much for your, your, your input and your perspectives. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ting and Anita. Well, you know, we're, we're moving right along here. So I'm going to go ahead and move us toward our second round table. And I just want to, um, you can always tell when you have some good themes, they start to start falling into each other. So the second round table is addressing lead in drinking water. And again, here are some potential discussion topics for the tribal representatives, lead service line replacement, uh, financing, corrosion control treatment, and find and fix. So again, I'd like to uh, open it up to the tribal representatives and uh, please come on camera and unmute your camera. And I'd like to open it up for discussion. Okay, Jerry, I see you on camera. Yes, I would like to address financing of the, of the uh, lead service line replacement. One aspect that we see is very important is in doing cap capital improvement planning, uh, not only to assess the on all of the assets of a of a water utility, but also to put together the financial plans for the um, any, any kind of work that needs to be done for for replacing um, uh, old old uh, elements of systems, uh, and then also to project out in the future, new new construction. Um, and, and so this, this financing piece is very important. This goes to the, the element that we've heard earlier in our, in our round table about, about the, um, the operations and, and maintenance and uh, it tied together with the capital improvement plans and infrastructure planning. So those are very important so that we don't uh, find ourselves again in a situation where we're looking back at old systems and finding that there are uh, public health issues that arise out of what we've done in uh, previous work. So I'll conclude there, thank you. Okay, thanks, Jerry. Um, Ray? Unmute your line, please. Right. Yes, as you know, um, Flint is um, the first one to go with this uh, service lines or whatever, but um, they're not they're not even doing anything right now. All, all the money is gone. City the city of Flint is broke. Uh, they sent us ninety four. Well, they sent us forty eight million of the ninety four million that we supposed to get. Uh, the, the mayor is holding on to it, so there's no city services. Uh, the garbage just they just stopped the garbage and us. Uh, Gave them a 90 day notice to get back in. So we got to find another garbage service here. So I don't know what they're told, told the EPA head that was going on here. But uh, what I wanted to know was that um, as a tribal, uh, can we get access to this uh, 48, some of this 48 million to help us in our infrastructure, what's going on? Because they're not doing anything with the lead service lines or anything at this time right now. Uh, like I said, you basically know the whole story about what's going on with the city of Flint and the data and everything. But um, I'm just that, that was the question that I've had that because I believe I'm going to have to step up the tribal council with the city council so that we can get some funding and some some help. So that was one question that I had. I'll go from there with that. OK, thanks, Ray. Gerald. key off uh, what Jerry was saying, and that's about the financial backing of tribal water systems. And when we talk about that, they were put in by BIA and IHSs and trying to maintain them systems on a, a very small budget um, is near impossible. Um, and the other part of that is how um, do you get um, I would say circuit riders, whoever, out and working with tribal systems and a part of management of tribal systems is developing that utilities management plan. And uh, it seems like a lot of them are operating on a day-to-day, -day, this is what we do, this is how we do it, whether it's right or wrong. But what um, sometimes helps is having a good uh, utilities management plan, like your little book, your little Bible. And I know there's a lot of uh, updates with technology going on now. And there's a, a, 
a need for help in them areas, as well as reassessing who is responsible for the systems that were put in many, many, many years ago, and how do we get them back to the table and say, this has to be a group effort, not uh, it's yours now, run with it. Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, Dr. Tate? Yes, with response to um, financial equity, I would just like to suggest to the agency that um, <clears throat> as we have these pools of monetary assistance, that we're ensuring that Indigenous people throughout America um, has access to financial equity. Um, everyone's situations are different. We have um, people so that we're doing it from, you know, tribal reservations, you're doing it from whole communities, like we work with communities within the community, you know, whatever the community is there, we work from a holistic perspective, right down to the individual um, family, so that we're making sure that every home, every community, every nation place is being touched as far as having access and financial equity to, um, to absolve themselves of having to, you know, to deal with any of the outcomes of lead poisoning. Because from our perspective as, as an American Indian, it's like, if I have good drinking water, I want my neighbor to have good drinking water. It doesn't make sense for us to be closed in and we have good drinking water, but our neighbors next door don't have good drinking water. That doesn't make sense, you know, ideologically, philosophically, spiritually, it just doesn't make sense. So I like to think from a holistic perspective, if we're drinking good water, we want everybody to be able to have it. So if there's ways that we can look at you know, how we can work communally and work with, you know, intergovernment agencies so that we can ensure that whatever areas, wherever our feet touches the soil, we want to make sure that every man, woman, child, no matter what really background, I know this is a tribal discussion, but, you know, as the caretakers of the planet, we want everybody to have good water. So if there's financial equity and there's access from community based to um, if there's a reservation-based, community-based, individual-based, we're touching every house. Because like I said, if I got good drinking water, I want my neighbor to have good drink. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Tate. Uh, David? Uh, thanks, Iris. Um, <clears throat> a couple of concerns here. Uh, Lionel at the last round table mentioned uh, O&M cost. And that's a real thing. Uh, some of these plants are very expensive to run, but uh, beyond that, they take some expertise that um, uh, for the resources that uh, NTUA has, we have a large pool of employees and we can usually find one or two among them that uh, knows how to run a plant. However, some of these tribes are very small and they may be looking far and wide trying to find expertise to run such a plant. Uh, we don't have very many surface water systems. We're putting, we just put one large one online and uh, corrosion control, fortunately, in that plant is not an issue. The downstream plants, as I mentioned earlier, uh, don't have uh, much lead in them, if at all. And again, uh, anything downstream of the meter is going to be problematic for us if we're going to be held responsible for uh, the, the lead in the water that comes out of the plumbing in those homes, uh, going into those homes to replace their plumbing or pieces of their plumbing uh, could open up uh, some complications for us. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave you with that. Thank you, David. Uh, Michael, did I see you come on here? Any comments? Yes, can you hear me? Michael, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, uh, sorry about earlier. I couldn't work out uh, the mute function on the Zoom platform. But anyway, I wanted to know what uh, what level of involvement do we expect IHS to have with uh, some of these new regulations coming out in regards to the lead and copper rules? Michael, I just want to uh, just just remind everyone that today is uh, for your feedback and comments. Uh, we're not answering questions, but um, you know, listening to anything that you might want to add to addressing lead in the drinking water. Okay, that was my only comment for now then. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Michael. Anu? Oh, you're on mute, Anu. We can't hear you. There you go. 
<laughs> it'll put the ear in the ear back in. Um, uh, it, as a national construction safety officer, with most of my experience in uh, pipelining uh, in the oil sands and throughout Alberta and um, uh, and BC, it 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 gives you the understanding when they're talking about you know when you want to find out when something happens, who's responsible. How do you get back to the uh, to the to 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 finding out where all the different red linings may have happened, dealing with the different spools, the systems, and all that other type of stuff? How did they actually put the system together? How did it actually fall apart? What actually happened in terms of um, uh, this developing and nobody catching it? So, as a national safety construction officer, one of the things that we do is that we provide safety. Um, along with quality control. So it looks like, uh, uh, and also investigations, right? So deep root cause analysis must be done in every situation where there is, and when I say deep root cause analysis, it should be a tap root, uh, tap root investigation. Uh, tap root investigation usually brings it back to, uh, to, to a point as to where, um, you can find out what's happening without really uh, blaming anybody because again, depending on training and all that other type stuff. But here, when we find out, and I have to really reiterate what's going on with the city of Flint, the city has absconded um, their ability to provide the proper services for the people in the area. Um, I know we have problems in Washington, there's problems in um, New York, problems in uh, Detroit, there's problems in um, <clears throat> Chicago, got problems in Kansas City. I mean, there's problems in um, Atlanta. Problems, there's problems all over the place. But in Flint, it seems as though no much, no much how much, and somebody, you know, we're talking about resources and safety, no much how much money they're throwing at this thing, the city is still broke and they haven't fixed the problem and they're a long way from fixing from completely fixing the underground infrastructure or understanding what's going on with it and understanding what's going on with the above ground infrastructure one of the recommendations that i would have is to completely take the city of flint out of the um ability of making decisions what's happening with the underground infrastructure period and what's happening with the above ground infrastructure they should not receive any money. Um, if there are local tribes that have people in the area, um, such as such as everyone that's on right now, they should be uh, more responsible and help guiding um, what's going on there. But I think that the city of Flint, I mean, I'm not saying disband the police, I'm not saying any of that kind of stuff. What I'm saying is, is that um, even the state, has failed in this responsibility and doing what it's supposed to be doing um, on a very serious sense. And this is not placing any blame. This is the reason why we really do need a taproot investigation. Um, because once we have that, and a taproot investigation takes about seven days. Once you have that, you'll have all the information that you need and you know exactly very quickly what has been done, what isn't done. When I was running the Brooksville Housing Authority, um, I got in there very quickly, We and, I, and I'm almost done, we sorted out all the problems that were going on on the underground and above ground infrastructure and HUD provided the money for us to be able to fix it, had most of those problems fixed within six months. So I'm, I'm, what I'm recommending, and this is a hard recommendation, is that uh, I, I believe that the tribal governments should take the lead in representing their people and being able to help lead them out of this death crisis that's going on over there in Flint. I know you can't thank answer. I'm just, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I just want to open it up for uh, anyone that I haven't heard your voice yet. Uh, Raquel or Brian or anyone else. Sean? I, I just kind of wanted to <clears throat> comment on the corrosion control treatment. Um, a lot of times in the past, when there's been a letter copper issue, uh, one of the first things that someone will turn to is adding a phosphate, which the, some of the science is now proving can just concentrate, you know, lead in 
uh, small quantities of water, you know, due to uh, velocity changes and things like that that could strip the uh, corrosion barrier from the pipe and, and pass it along to the customer, which is kind of like an isolated event of concentrated lead. Um, I, I've always been a proponent of actually doing a proper corrosion control study, you know, and, and tweaking the treatment technique. I've seen it in two smaller community systems. They were resource strapped, uh, not treating their water the way they should. Um, and just by actually showing up every day and doing what you're supposed to do, made a drastic improvement and uh, completely turned around those systems, lead and copper issues. Uh, so what I'm saying is when it comes to the resources involved in that relationship between regulatory agency and a water system, when they have an issue, actually uh, hand in hand addressing the issue and making sure that the right decisions are being made to not just kick the can down the road. That's why I'm a big proponent and a big fan of the lead and copper line replacement aspect of the revisions um, and trying to actually get to the root cause instead of you know the symptoms of these types of problems. Even though I, like a lot of other people, would be cautious about actually identifying because you're not sure what resources you have. Uh, it's kind of all circling back, but I do believe uh, a much closer um, regulatory relationship uh, in in a corrosion control uh, treatment study uh, for the individual system could actually result in a better path forward for the water system. Uh, because a lot of water systems may have one operator, you know, that's not necessarily that seasoned or, you know, those types of operator resources and stuff are, are scarce in smaller systems and across some systems in Indian country. So it's a big concern that they may not be seasoned enough or have the help they need to make the right decisions to improve the system in a short term solution. Thank you, Sean. Anyone else have any comments? Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. And again, I, I'd like to just open it up for some reflection from Yu Ting and Anita. Thank you, Iris, and thank you to all who have um, given us your thoughts and feedback. Um, it's, it's interesting that different kind of um, themes emerge from <laughs> different sessions of the conversation. I think for this one, what I'm taking away is this holistic approach. Um, and, you know, a lot of the working together and planning together uh, when we're looking at the finance uh, is not just about the capital improvement, but it's also looking forward, um, like what Jerry has said. And um, Again, what Dr. Tate has said about being uh, working together, a lot of the theme that does come up in terms of also for EPA to coordinate with this federal partner, um, such as IHS. And um, I, I think I, another kind of an emerging theme that I think we are hearing here is the challenge of the workforce uh, for the water sector and with the, ex, with the kind of the expertise that's needed to um, a run a water system and um, to identify issues. Um, really appreciate Anu's um, uh, sharing your experience um, in safety and quality control and this uh, tap root cause analysis that you are offering uh, for our consideration. And also Sean, um, appreciating your um, feedback about the importance of a treatment study that, that should be accompanying a corrosion um, control technology. Um, I'm gonna turn over to Anita uh, for her to provide her reflection as well. Thanks, uh, Yu Tang, and thanks everyone once again for your perspective and all your comments. And you, you captured um, almost everything that I, that, I, that, that I heard. And, um, and also I wanna emphasize what I heard from Sean about um, you know, really dealing with the root, uh, root cause issue and not the symptoms, and that you know that replacing lead service lines is is important and supportive of that. But then it's also that the economy of do we have the right resources 
uh, to actually facilitate the replacement, the cost with that, the funding, and also looking at this, the funding of all your all the drinking water systems in tribal communities um, to, uh, to understand how, how to ensure funding, but also understand how to ensure operation and maintenance costs as well. So um, we heard how all that's connecting as a routine was mentioning in Dr. Tate, this really holistic approach to the, um, to, to, to the entire process and not just looking at it in silos. So really appreciate your thoughts and perspectives on that. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Um, so again, we're, we're doing good on our time and we're moving to our third and final round table. And I just wanna point out the theme for this discussion is communication and public outreach. And uh, our potential discussion topics are sampling for lead in schools and childcare facilities, communicating sample results and risk, and public education and outreach. And so with that, I'd like to open it up for um, comments from the tribal representatives. Anu? I just want to say that um, I am uh, with everybody that's that's on here today. I feel for every single one of the um, tribal governments, what they're going through uh, when they have to see any of their children in their schools go through anything uh, such as lead poisoning. Um, it is devastating. It is something that is not reversible. Um, in many cases, it's like... Um, uh, permanent, and it is very, very, very debilitating. And, you know, we have to remember that, again, we are humans, people are getting hurt, and uh, we have to really dig deep down inside ourselves and make sure that the resources are going to be used the way that they're intended to be used in a very sincere purpose. And the decisions that we're making here today, uh, the there's a lot of young people's lives that depend on it. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anu. Um, Dr. Beamer? I really want to thank all the colleagues here today for all their comments and, and to keep hearing what an issue this is across our country and in so many communities um, as we struggle with it here in Arizona as well. And... Um, Going back to the comments about the schools, I think there, we really need to be really clear what the coordination and follow through would be once lead is identified in a school. Here in the state of Arizona, we did test a lot of our schools under the state um, Department of Environmental Quality a few years ago with no coordination with the health department and no follow up for testing in schools or how to communicate to parents or um, any kind of resources for blood testing. and you know, there needs to be an effort that if we're going to test all these schools, which I applaud, I think that's in an important place because lead exposure is most important for children early in their life. We want to identify them and reduce their exposures as soon as possible. But we need to be able to follow up in those schools and there needs to be, I know that it's out of EPA's jurisdiction, but I, I do think that there needs to be a more concerted effort on how to coordinate across all these agencies and follow through with the health departments because otherwise we're just going to scare a lot of families and schools without uh, Dr. resources to fix it. Just ask you a quick a clarifying question uh, because of the university you're in. Uh, what do you find is some of the most effective communication, communication approaches with tribes? Um, we've, I've done a lot of work on communicating environmental health risks back to people that we've actually done blood lead testing. And, and we did do that, um, myself and Dr. Carletta Chief on the Navajo Nation following the Gold King Mine Spill. And um, we found various different ways of doing it. Um, we had some follow through. We did work with Indian Health Service to make sure that they were aware that we were doing that. Um, we provided resources to the people when. Um, we did identify potential concern, um, but we also spent a lot of time um, providing information when we thought the levels were low uh, and reassuring people about their exposures and 
and stuff like that. And we spent a lot of time working with community health representatives on this topic. They're so great at communicating this kind of information and going back and forth with all the documents we put together. I think we went through 10 to 20 drafts with them and got feedback from multiple people on that. Thank you very much. Dr. Tate? Uh, yes, and I, I definitely would like um, I thank you for those comments, um, Dr. Palamo. Um, it is important to have um, interagency, intergovernmental coordination with um, not just with the EPA, but with I'm glad that the IHS is here um, because that was one of the things I wanted to uh, to to mention is to have that um, interagency, intergovernment, intertribal, inter indigenous nation coordination so that we can again. I'm just going back to that point of holistic. Um, I've spent over 20 20 plus years in education, um, a lot of it in public education. And now uh, we're facilitating our own indigenous um, educational platform and education for um, the families and people that we serve in different communities across the United States. Um, and it would be helpful that if the EPA agency, along with Indian Health Service, I'm glad that um, the gentleman had mentioned that, in coordinated efforts in helping to support our health systems. Um, coordinating with public health as well, but also for our holistic health. Like we're getting ready to launch an indigenous um, holistic clinic um, because when you're looking at the outcomes, um, Ambassador New was right on point with that. We're not looking, we have to look at the outcomes of this, not as a quick fix, but they are very, they're long-term far reaching effects when children are affected by lead. And I think we all know that, right? Because a lot of our children, indigenous communities, children of color, they are targeted for special education. And they're also targeted for school criminalization. That was a big part of my dissertation and looking at ways. So when we're educating the public, when we're educating schools, um, if there are indigenous children who are still in the public school sector, I mean, our school, obviously, and most tribal schools are very different in our approach and how we educate. But teachers and uh, superintendents, um, any school practitioners or stakeholders need to understand that uh, children that have um, the added environmental stress of not only, you know, being in a, you know, social, political, quote unquote, minority group, but also because you've been affected by environmental stress or as being poisoned by your own water. There are traumatic, there are traumatic psychological effects of that. And that the educational piece of that goes far beyond us just fixing the pipes these children can have a long range of just being criminalized in school because we are not looking at behaviors from a holistic perspective. So if you have a particular community like in the in the communities that you all are speaking of today and of the communities that we see in Flint and in Memphis and other places where we're servicing um, indigenous families, that if you kind of look at the statistics of schools and look at behaviors and look at what children are targeted for you know, special education treatment or out of um, looking at school criminalization, you'll see some very interesting statistics of that. So that's why we have to look at it from a coordinated, a holistic view is looking at the whole community. Where does things start? It's not just the pipe. It's not just replacing the pipe. It's not even just the manpower. We got to look at the whole thing and the human part of this and what this can mean for families and children and the, and the burden of families who are not equipped, you know, to work with their own children who have these, um, you know, will have behavioral slash educational neurological issues and they need support. So it will be helpful if the agency can work with the IHS, a IHS and the IHS can work with us and all of our, um, to, to give additional educational services and to support those holistic health um, practices that, um, that we think will be better approaches for, um, uh, you know, addressing our health issues as well. That would help. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tate. Uh, Ray? Yes, um, I wanted to speak on the issue of the schools. Um, Elon Musk, a billionaire, uh, gave us money to uh, pre put new water fountains into the, all the schools, or the public schools. No, nothing has been done, nothing. University, the university, University of Michigan, Flint, University of Michigan State, <laughs> you can name, name the rest of them. 
there's a they're studying us they're getting paid for us but at the same time the last thing i wanted to do was not and, and i put a link in there so i'm really just trying to show you the dire emergency was going on i mean even a billionaire give us give us money and the schools are still don't have water fountains for the kids to <laughs> um the epa it says right here it says the new epa administrator on flint visited we are here to learn like you like you're here to listen and he said the new EPA administrator, Michael Reagan, visited the McKenzie Patrice Croom Flint Community Water Testing Lab. That, that lab is for children. They're, 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 we're at the point where children are testing our water. <laughs> and, and, you're, and you're really not getting back any results. That's what they showed the head EPA of, of the city of Flint. And children are testing our water. You see what I'm saying? I, I sent you the link of it. And then we have failed beyond failed and failed again on any testing that they've done with the water. As a uh, ambassador, Anu has said, um, we we uh, that's why we're at this point. We're sitting here with you, talking with you now, and hope that you hear what we're saying. It is an emergency going on here. I don't. I, I compare it to genocide and gentrification. It, it makes me like uh, sick to my stomach and want to pass out right now just talking to you about it, what's going on here. But um, I just wanted to get that point in. I know we don't have much time. But from the schools to everything else that you're saying, uh, we're dying here. And um, the, the, from PFAS to, to what happened in the Detroit with the flooding, the, as the water coming from there, that 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 water, no one spoke on that water from Detroit that we're getting. Uh, they they made bond deals on stuff that we have to pay back. We won't have to pay back the six hundred forty one six hundred forty million dollars once she does that. I mean, it's just one thing after another. So um, I just wanted to get that in that we're covering all those points from the schools to everything else. And um, I appreciate you so much for listening. And I will go from there and I will contact you. will hear from me again. Thank you. Thank you, you Ray. Thank you so much. Uh, Sean? Hey, I, I just wanted to mention, um, <clears throat> this all does tie back into, uh, uh, there's a looming shortage of actual certified uh, and adequately trained operators, you know, that's still looming out there in the distance. Uh, there's been a lot of efforts to try to stave that off and, and build that workforce. But those utility managers and operators are the ones that kind of make sure this stuff gets done and done well and, and are the kind of implementers uh, of these types of things that protect human health. Uh, I have seen a lot better training materials and things come out of EPA the last couple of years and, and uh, recorded webinars that you can reference back to. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of information has been improved on the way that it's uh, available for uh, people that really want to know. Um, but I just wanted to kind of touch on that. The training is key to make sure that the utility personnel know what they need to do, how best to do it uh, and, and continue in that training effort to to better that knowledge in those uh, professionals that are trying to do their best, uh, but also uh, further support peer assistance programs. I know there's been a little bit of movement in that through some different organizations recently, but to continue to, to do that because everybody on this round table, you know, is willing and you know, more than happy to try to help each other because we're all trying to make an impact in our individual areas, but we don't want to leave anybody behind. And there's been several comments like that. So it kind of proves the the spirit of the people that you're dealing with in Indian country. And uh, I just wanted to kind of touch base on that. Training peer assistance programs are a way to continue to not only affect the lead and copper issue, but even PFAS and all these other things that we have coming down the line. So. Just wanted to touch base on that. Thank you, Sean. Uh, anyone else online have any comments on the third top, uh, round table? Brian? Hey, good day, everyone. I just wanted to build upon what everybody else has already been talking about, that these revisions, you know, is going to be a big lift for a lot of the tribal utilities who are already working just on the margin of, of being able to keep up with the operations and maintenance and compliance. 
uh, with the regulations. And so while you know this this improvement, these revisions are such a huge improvement, but there needs to be resources there, additional resources to help tribal utilities um, be able to implement um, what's coming. Um, I just really want to stress that because we're already on the margin of being able to keep up. And um, while these changes are really important, we, there, there's got to be additional resources, both for the tribal utilities. I and mean, we're talking about you know, a public relations a team <laughs> that they're gonna have to employ um, to, to be able to implement this. And, um, uh, and there needs to be technical assistance providers that have the adequate resources to be right there along the lines with these tribal utility uh, the operators and the utility managers, and and because it's this is going to be a long haul, uh, walking through, the helping the utilities walk through their tribal communities through this, this journey of of trying to improve the situation. So with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and disconnect here. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Again, I would I just want to call on anyone for any. Oh, Jerry. Um, I do, and, and it's just on the, the matter of communications. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that there really needs to be a set of principles for how to communicate this SLID, uh, uh, testing results. There is great diversity in tribal nations and how they function and operate. And so rather than having uh, an onslaught of agencies and and uh, technical assistance providers entering a tribal nation, that there be a set of protocols for how to engage a tribal nation and to um, uh, organize a, a way to communicate the, about the, the lead and copper rule revisions, about the the, the testing or the opportunities for testing, walking all the way through communicating results so that they're, they're uh, uh, provided in a way that's appropriate for, for each tribal community, and that there's um, information, that, uh, health information available as well. Uh, I, I know just from any health, we know in, in the last year and a half when there are uh, uh, public health announcements or guidelines issued that that they need to they need to be uh, relevant and culturally appropriate. So I'm I, so I'm I'm just thinking there needs to be a set of, of protocols or principles set out for how to communicate with tribal nations that that um, it makes accommodations for wide diversity. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, David? Uh, thanks, Iris. Uh, a few, a few uh, points I wanted to make. Um, the slide presentation had a huge amount of information in it. Uh, I could hardly keep up. I, every time a point was, was made, my brain would start working on, well, okay, what's the impact of this? What's the impact of that? So I'd really appreciate if you guys could share that with us. Um, another point I wanted to make was um, uh, the the trigger level and the action level. Uh, I'll have to discern the difference between those two. I can do that on my own time. But um, what I've noticed throughout my career is is M, as MCLs come down, the there there may be technology out there to deal with it, but it becomes uh, more sensitive to operate and more difficult to operate. And it's it's uh, more sensitive to upset and whatnot. And, and I know nobody wants poison in their water and we want it removed, but there is a cost to doing that. And I wanna make sure that that's recognized. We, we have spent millions and millions building arsenic water treatment plants to get uh, down to 10 parts per billion. And some of those plants are, are tough to operate sometimes and they're in remote places and they're on small systems and they would never be able to survive on their own without 
the resources that a large utility authority can bring to that small community. We have, of course, we have some systems that uh, don't uh, that don't have those problems, they're easy to operate. And so the revenue we generate from those larger systems can be shared with those smaller ones to run those, those tougher plans. Um, I also wanted to share some success that we've had, uh, particularly getting messages out to our customers. We have what's called bill stuffers. And so we can uh, put in those envelopes messages, those salient messages we need to get out to our customers. And that's been successful. Uh, part of the message uh, for lead and copper is going to be trying to identify, clearly identify who is doing what and who is responsible for what uh, without scaring anybody. Uh, yeah, lead, lead is an issue. It's an acute issue. Uh, but we don't want to scare 99.99% of our population for those few that sincerely are affected by it and they need to get that message. Um, uh, and that, yeah, that concludes my points. Thank you. Thank you, David. I have Lionel and then Ray. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, just one point I wanted to go back to the resources and everything like that. When when those things become available and when people can start going uh, re receiving resources, I think it's uh, very important that it be equitable. Uh, I know a lot of the bigger tribes seem to get uh, a bulk some of the money and uh, and uh, some of the smaller reservations that kind of don't get that because a lot of these things are based on population and whatnot, but they don't come into, sometimes they don't look at the complexity of some of these systems that these smaller tribes may have and the only resources they have are, are, are what they have uh, on their land. So they have to treat their water in different uh, capacities. So uh, even, even though they may not be serving as big of a population, they still have that, uh, need those resources for those kind of technolo uh, technology, the advanced systems. Uh, another issue that I think they need to be brought into play is bringing in some of the federal um, partners on this is that a lot of the schools on Indian country are run by BIA, BIE, and sometimes the funding isn't there for them to do these thus upgrades. And, and in fact, like uh, some of the instances way back in what, a couple of, about a, 10 years ago, you guys all did a AOC, uh, a global settlement with them to make them uh, do um, infrastructure upgrades to those facilities and whatnot. And I think maybe that's one of the things that you guys don't like to do to other federal entities, but I think that a lot more need, of that needs to be done to uh, keep those, uh, those other federal partners in check because um, once they uh, get finished with doing whatever repairs, then it goes back and gets dilapidated again. And there's no resources to keep that up going with those partners because they're the ones that run up a bulk of our schools on, on reservations. So I think those are the issues that we really need to bring into as well as bringing in BIA, BIE into these conversations, because a lot of times uh, they're more reactionary than being proactive in uh, what they're doing for our, for our kids on the reservation. So uh, that's just one of the things I wanted to bring up. Thank you, Lionel. Uh, Ray? Yeah, the last thing I wanted to say was um, there's a lot of land right now that the EPA holds right here in the city of Flint and plus they're working on that contains contamination and stuff like that from uh, past work, plus, plus what's going on with the lead in the water or something like that. Plus the surrounding area that I have with the lake, uh, there's, there's, there's poison, the land is poison. What it is is that I'm bringing forth the, I, I'm not, I'm going beyond the idea. We're going to, uh, it's a fact that uh, hemp, can remove the poison from the land. And um, uh, I'm, I'm saying the EPA holds a lot of the land that's going on around here. They're doing a lot of work. There's a lot of poison, this period going on here. Um, the United States Supreme Court said that each individual of the 100,000 here in the city of Flint has a right to step before the U to, to, to sue the EPA. I'm not trying to go in that direction. I wanna work with the EPA. I believe that you should have, I should be able to work with you on that point of uh, growing hemp on our land, which will make us a self-sufficient people to do what we have to do for ourselves because our city, our county, Genesee County, the state, the federal government has failed us as a people, as a, as a nation, as a tribe, as the original people to this land. So I am asking, I am here, uh, we're going before the United Nations. We, 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 we uh, put things in there, I've showed you what's going on. I, I got more for you if you need it. 
but EPA is working on a lot of land around here that we can remove the poison from the land and, and, and become a substitution people for ourselves. And I just wanted to put that on record. As you said, you're listening. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all. You have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Anyone else? Uh, I don't want to close it out too quickly. If you have any final comments, any other tribal? Okay, Sean? I just also wanted to comment on the equity uh, in tribal country. It, it has to account for the disproportionate effects in tribal country as well. So, I mean, it's just it goes hand in hand to make sure that it's equitable. You have to actually scope the issue. I just wanted to raise that one little point. Thanks, Sean. Dr. Tate, did you raise your hand? Okay, sorry. I'm sorry. I just wanted to make a, um, a fine, uh, just a, a final closing comment. Um, thank you for the opportunity. And um, again, hopefully um, we'll, walk, we'll walk away with, you know, with action steps to work collectively um, within intergovernment, within interagency, and a tribal inner um, indigenous nations. And that um, we're America and human rights belongs to everybody. We're the caretakers. And that's what I like to see us as caretakers is to promote that. Again, if I'm well, I want my neighbor to be well. And we know that um, um, this was a quote from, you know, the human rights, um, the United Nations website, you know, having access to safe drinking water and sanitation is central to living a life in dignity and upholding human rights. Yet billions of people, including here in America, still do not enjoy these fundamental rights. The human rights to water and sanitation require the drinking water and water for personal and domestic usage as well as sanitation and hygiene facilities are available, accessible, safe, acceptable, and affordable for all without discrimination. Um, and these elements are clearly interrelated. So we need the health services, we need the EPA, we need tribals, we need people of professional capacity and those who are mostly affected by these issues to come together. And we can we can actually do it. You know, we're all about next steps at Kusa Nation. Um, when we meet as council, um, whatever issues are on the table, but we always you know, address our issues from the issue of human rights, indigenous rights, to live and exist as who you are and have access to, you know, our air and water um, in in healthy flow. Because <laughs> without that, what do we, without that, then, you know, how do we survive? So I just want to leave it on that note with that. Thank you. Mahalo. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tate. Anyone else? Tribal representatives? Raquel? Hi. Um, I just have a, a quick comment. And uh, I was actually had to take care of some stuff and had to step out of the room for a little bit uh, during the first round table. But I do have some comments on that with regards to um, challenges. Um, with collecting tap water samples based on the new regulation requirements. Uh, currently we, you know, assemble bottle kits for our operators to where um, they go out and collect one, one liter um, container of sample. Um, they, they work with the um, customers that we have in educating them and letting them know, you know, what the requirement is for collecting the sample, uh, making sure that they meet the six hour stagnation time before they collect the sample. So, you know, even that in itself is um, in some instances um, difficult to work with the customer in that way and, and, and educating them and letting them know the importance of, of why we're doing this. Um, and then also on the back end, you know, once we get the results back in sharing that information with them and letting them know, you know, what we've tested for, what their particular sample um, result readings are, it, um, so there's a there's a lot that needs to occur um, with the education part, and I'm just hoping that um, EPA does provide um, quite a bit of technical support on that side of things, you know, to try to help us as utility um, um, companies to work with our customers and getting them the um, information that they need to fully understand, you know, what what did they participate in, what does that mean for them moving forward. 
and even in the future, you know, um, it, this would be only the first round of sampling. So what's to happen in the future after, you know, the revisions and everything has 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 gone through the first round? Um, what does it mean further down the road? So going back to the um, the sample clip part, you know, some of our water systems are right now scheduled to collect as many as um, 20 um, lead and copper, and that's just with a single bottle. And, and, and with the new requirements, that would entail us having to send out uh, six or what is that, um, 100 bottles almost. And, um, you know, having to educate the, the homeowner on you know, you have to collect all these five bottles and in these uh, in in this particular order, and then from that set that you get back, you know, um, having to analyze bottle number five for um, for lead to make sure that there's nothing there. I think it, it's going to be a huge task. Um, the other point that I also wanted to hit on was the challenges um, regards in regards to um, accessing um, tap sampling locations on the reservation. You know, it, it's it's difficult enough as it is, you know, with um, a lot of the remote locations where um, our operators have to drive out to uh, on the dirt roads to these different um, customers that are identified for lead and copper sampling. Um, but, you know, there's times when customers are not home. Um, maybe they have vacated the premises and um, have moved elsewhere. So we kind of have to take a look at the water system again to determine alternate locations that meet the tiered um, sampling requirements. Um, the other the other hindrance would be um, maybe the customer that we had been working with now no longer receives water at their location. So we kind of have to do a, a reassessment and then pick an alternate site. Um, you know, our lead and copper sampling window is from June to September each year. And so, you know, um, there are some years where we have so many samples that are are due based on our monitoring schedules. And so it, it's it's difficult to try to get everything done within that particular sampling window. So those are just some of the, um, the challenges um, that, that I wanted to share with, on those, um, the um, identifying lead in drinking water. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Any other tribal representative? Any closing thoughts? Well, thank you so much today. And I'd like to uh, call upon <laughs> Yu Ting and Anita for some reflections for this round table. Great, thanks so much, Iris. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna go first and then Ting can add in there. And this was a very robust discussion on the communications and the public outreach. And what we, what we did here is really looking at the entire whole community. Um, and that means, you know, if we're gonna do, especially focusing on the schools, we need clear coordination with multiple agencies as well as with the department of with the department of health and the communication to the parents what does that look like and also looking at uh, starting at the community level to get their feedback and input on on that communication and jerry brought up a great point when it talks about communications as a whole was to look at how to develop a set of protocols or principles on how to um, to engage communities um, with the various tribal nations um, and, to, and when we look at those kind of principles and protocols, all their opportunities, the focusing on opportunities for testing, what the communication results should be like, and how that does that connect to the public health, but then make it really appropriate for, appropriate for each tribal community. Then once again, the coordination, looking at not just as Dr. Tate said, interagency, intergovernmental, intertribal, um, and inter indigenous coordination and also that coordination with EPA and IHS um, so that the whole community can be uh, looked at because as folks know, it's as um, Dr. Paloma mentioned, it's important to do the school testing, but then we need to have a follow-up and a follow-through with that. 
Sean, you bring up the concern about the shortage of certified trained operators, and uh, we at CAP, we had we had captured that previously. Is really looking at the workforce as a whole, and that the key training is key, but also focusing on the support uh, support for their peer assistance program. Um, with that, um, and and then with, with all that, we're talking about resources and um, equitable distribution distribution of resources and maybe not looking at just based on population of a particular tribe, but look at the complexity of the various uh, drinking water systems that might be on that tribe. And, um, and Raquel brought up, um, mentioned several challenges that focus um, dealing with the rule itself, looking at the collecting of the tap water samples, uh, more about the complexity of that versus the first and the fifth leader, and also the challenges of the tap sampling locations to ensure you get the tier one requirement when on tribe, uh, tri uh, tribal communities. That can be a challenge due to the nature of people moving and they're not getting water there um, and things of that nature. And Yuting, I'm sure there's a lot. There was, this was a very robust conversation in this particular session. Thank you, Anita. I agree. Um, this has been a very good conversation, very robust, and a lot of feedback. Uh, I really do not have much to add on to what Anita has said, but I just want to make sure that um, that you guys hear that we we have heard your comment. I think is um, Lionel who talk about the equitable distribution that accounts uh, beyond population. Um, very important point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, really just uh, all the thoughtful feedback um, from this group here. We sincerely appreciate what um, you have been very forthcoming. And um, another point I wanna point out in this session that had kind of come through for me as a theme is the need for technical assistance. Um, the, the need, this whole idea about the peer to peer was a great idea and really understanding that um, the difficulty in both the costs and also tech the technical knowledge and expertise in managing the water systems. So thank you again for your thoughtful feedback. Thank you. Uh, so we're getting ready to close. And uh, before I do that, I'd just like to thank all of the nations that are here today and all of you that uh, work for our people. I thank you so much. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anita for her closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Iris, and I want to thank you to everyone that participated in today's roundtable discussion. Uh, we, EPA, we appreciate the time you've taken the day to join us and to provide your input on the land copper rule revisions. Your perspective will help EPA as we review the land copper rule revisions. We acknowledge that you may have additional comments you would like to share with us on the land copper rule revisions, and we invite all participants and any members of the public listening via the live stream to submit additional comments to the docket at regulations.gov. Once again, thank you very much for all your thoughtful input and perspectives. Thank you, Anita. And with that, this closes our session today. And again, thank you so much for joining us.